Hello, and welcome everyone to tonight's virtual Riverside chat with our special guest, rowing strength coach, Will Ruth, here to discuss core strength tra training for masters. Uh, before we get into interjections, just a bit about upcoming chats. Uh, sessions in November will be with founder of Chaos Rowing in North Carolina, Felix Mullabach, to discuss sculling, building a great system. In mid-November, we'll have coach Neil Bergenroth to discuss understanding for force curve, curves to improve. And at the end of November, we'll hear from North Bay Rowing Club member and founder, Greg Saboren, to talk about the history of and efforts to build a community boathouse. In early December, U.S. national team coxswain Colette Lucas Conwell will join us. And following her um, in the following week, we'll have Kendall Chase with the U.S. national team. Feel free to contact me for more details and suggestions for possible topics and speakers for this venue. I'll put me, I'll post my um, email address into the chat a little bit later on. Um, I first was introduced to Will Roos coaching through his strength training program. He provided for masters rowers during this fall's US rowing virtual training camp for masters. In addition to that, I did a one hour consultation with him to develop an individualized strength training program designed around my goals, the equipment I had on hand, etc. It, it was a very rewarding and instructive session and um, it completely renewed my joy for strength training, making it accessible to me in a way that I had not experienced before. And I've, and I've done a lot of strength training in my athletic life. Um, you know, who, who knew doing a few progressive squats each day would strengthen my glutes and my lats and remedy my lower back issues. Um, it was it's just amazing. So highly recommend that. Will is an exceptional rowing strength coach. He's the author of rowingstronger.com. He's also one of the founders of Science of Rowing, an online monthly journal, the go-to resource for coaches and rowers of all levels. Uh, each month, three coaches, himself, Blake Gorley, and Joe DeLeo, read across dozens of academic journals for rowing relevant research, deliver summaries and takeaways from the most relevant articles and discuss practical applications via audio roundtables and supporting bonus content. Past issues have included discussions on core training in rowing, breathing strategies for rowers and the effects of caffeine on rowing performance and more. A little bit about his personal background. Uh, Will rowed in high school in Washington State came back to the sport as the strength coach for Western Washington University men's program, and then went, moved to Vermont where he lives today, running the rowingstronger.com website, and um, as well as guest coaching at the Crassbury Schooling Center. He has a BS in kinesiology and an MA in sports coaching, and is a National Strength and Conditioning Association certified strength and conditioning specialist. Um, if you haven't done so already, I highly encourage you to check out his complete guide to rowing warm-up, um, and that's on his rowingstronger.com website, along with many, many other articles. He's a prolific writer, and um, you'll find a tremendous amount of information and knowledge there that you can immediately apply um, to your rowing on and off the water in your strength training. Um, and his, uh, I'd also recommend checking out his Mobility for Rower series on YouTube as well. Um, in tonight's session on core strength training for masters, we'll discuss what the core is, how exactly these muscles function in the rowing stroke and how we can strength train for improved performance and reduce risk of injuries. Uh, please join me in a warm welcome to our guest, Will Ruth. Will, thanks again for sharing your expertise on rowing strength training with us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Thanks. Uh, so here's just a little bit about where I'm coming from. Uh, as far as like the purpose of strength training for rowing, because I think that this is where the presentation needs to start to really clarify what we are doing with core strength training. Um, I'm going to go from here into a discussion of what the core muscles are, how they function in the rowing stroke, and then of course the actual exercises uh, that that I most use with rowers and my progression for core strength training with rowers and how that fits into the bigger picture of the training program. So. Um, the first major goal for strength training for rowing is improving movement patterns. Uh, there's a lot that the rowing stroke does not do to develop general athletic skills. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of ways that we can use land-based strength training, not just to pile strength onto the muscles, but, but to improve the ways that, that athletes move, whether they're juniors, college rowers, masters rowers, anything in between. 
The next thing we're going to try to do is increase loading capacity over time. So we do want to improve <clears throat> and increase the amount of work that athletes can do. Strength training is a big part of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Strength training is a big part of that for increasing the athlete's uh, general force capacity. So if, if the amount of effort that you're exerting on the stroke is a very high percentage of your max force, it's going to be really hard to, to demonstrate that consistently uh, throughout a race. So really important that we gradually improve the amount of load that athletes can handle and then, and then display through the rowing stroke. Major purpose is transferring force through muscles rather than through the skeleton, especially where core training is involved. Uh, keeping load off of the spine means putting load somewhere else. So in, we always want this to be through muscles rather than through skeletal structures. And yet so many uh, common rowing errors do come from uh, athletes not being able to effectively load muscles and loading the skeleton instead. And then my final point is availability is better than ability. So I would rather have an athlete consistently available to train and race rather than somebody who can achieve a really high peak performance, but maybe can't do so consistently. So basically, does it matter how strong you are, how fit you are, how great your technique is, whatever, if you're too hurt to actually compete on, on race day. So something that I'm always considering in strength training for rowing is how can we improve athlete availability? And then also how can we improve general ability? And then a few things that I find that rowing coaches and strength coaches often want to go to uh, that I don't use strength training for is to simulate rowing or erging. Uh, so really, really high rep stuff performed for, oh, well, it looks like this in the stroke, whatever. Um, I, I think that that's generally a misuse of strength training. I'll, I'll talk more about that as we go. Um, I also don't use strength training for so-called build mental toughness. Um, I think a lot of times this just looks like making things really, really hard, but without any actual sense of progression or, or purpose or building towards something bigger. Uh, and then I don't use strength training to evaluate rowing ability. So people often ask about, about strength standards for rowing and how strong do I need to be or how much do I need to squat or deadlift or something in order to do X, Y, or Z on the erg or on the water. Um, and I, I'm not sure that the ability to squat 185 pounds tells me much about your ability to row 2,000 meters or 1,000 meters or whatever your competitive distance is. Um, so th those are just a few, a few, a few things that I don't use strength training for rowing for. Talking more specifically about the core, uh, there is a bit of a nomenclature issue with the core. Uh, people often say that it's it's the abs or it's the trunk or they'll say trunk flexors uh one one definition i heard was everything between the knees and the elbows uh which then includes about 85 percent of the muscles in the human body uh as as part of the core so um i wanted to start with just an idea that there's not necessarily a clean definition. Uh, and in fact, if you're at a coaching conference sometime and you want to start an argument, uh, ask the coaches around you what, what they consider to be the core, um, and it, it should ignite pretty quickly. Uh, because everybody has different definitions and different things that they like to focus on or emphasize. And fundamentally, it's the muscles in the middle of our body. They all connect to the different skeletal structures. They all interact with the upper halves and the lower half. So it's very hard to just say, here's a clean definition that I isolates just this, just this midsection. So wh wh whatever word you like to use, um, I figured that if a, if a picture says a thousand words, then a video does even better. So I just wanted to show this real quick. I'm not sure. Je Jessica, are you hearing the audio too, or is that just on my side? In any case, I, I just wanted to use this video just to demonstrate the complexity of all of the muscles involved and all of the different skeletal articulations. Uh, because if, if you've been just thinking about the core as the abs, the rectus abdominis, the six-pack muscle... As you can see here, there's a ton more going on. And part of our improving movement patterns and improving loading capacity for the athletes is finding ways to tie in all of these different muscles into the motion of the rowing stroke. And making sure that we're training all of these both both on the on the water and on the land. <clears throat>
So anyway, just to demonstrate how, how much is going on in that bid section. And then as far as what exactly the core does in rowing, that's also something that I've, I've heard a lot of controversy around, a lot of different ideas as far as, as, far as front end of the stroke, back end of the stroke, uh, what, what action is happening, where at what time. So this is a great opportunity where I turned to academic research to try to understand some of what is going on uh, under the hood, so to speak. And in this study, researchers used uh, electromyography or EMG, which gives uh, muscle activity readings. And they used uh, five strokes from a 2000 meter race simulation. So essentially an erg test, these are not rowers rowing at paddle pressure. They wanted to actually understand what was happening under, under high output. Um, and so here's their depiction of how the, how the trunk muscles work. So from the top here at the latissimus dorsi, what we're basically looking for is not not peak output from any one muscle to compare to another muscle, but comparing the muscle's output against itself. So this is the catch of the front end of the stroke at the left side of the graph, and then the finish is at the right side. So they did not quantify recovery. But just look at this as far as drive. What we see is that the front half of the stroke is characterized by very high posterior trunk muscle activity. So this is latissimus dorsi or the lats. Uh, this is erector spinae, thoracic and lumbar spinal erectors, uh, gluteus maximus, aka the glutes, and then biceps femoris, aka the hamstrings. So we see that the posterior trunk, and obviously they broadened out up and down a little bit um, from, from just the spinal area, is highly active at the front end of the drive. And then there's a brief period of coactivation where multiple muscles are all engaging. And then at the back end, uh, here's external abdominal oblique, rectus abdominis, and transverse abdominis. Then the abs really take over uh, toward the release. So here's a picture of basically what's going on uh, in, in the rowing stroke. So at, at the front end, we're really producing a lot of force with the posterior trunk muscles. And then what this research indicates is that th the anterior trunk muscles, aka the abs, act as a braking mechanism, B-R-A-K, to slow down the torso swing. So at the front end of the drive, we're resisting the most amount of force against the water. We are really, or against the flywheel you know, on the erg, really pushing hard, engaging the posterior trunk muscles. Then as the torso begins to swing, something has to stop the torso. Otherwise you would end up flat on your back against, against the erg or against the boat. So that's, that's what the abdominal muscles do is slow the torso swing into the back end and then back to the body over position on the recovery. So that's, that's a really crucial idea for understanding what these muscles actually do in the stroke. And if we don't understand what they actually do, then it's very hard to think about how we actually train them. So one of the exercises that I'll bash on a little bit as we go is the front plank. I mean, it's heavily used in rowing training. And yet the plank is an exercise that specifically trains co-contraction or activating the abdominal muscles at the same time as the posterior trunk muscles. And yet we don't actually see much co-contraction in the rowing stroke for a very brief moment as the, as the posterior trunk muscles hand over to the anterior trunk muscles between front of the drive and, and the back of the drive. So why are we spending so much time and energy and making such a thing out of a co-contraction exercise when actually what we see is high posterior activation, then minimal co-contraction co and high anterior activation toward the back end. So obviously that was a study that was done on the ERG. This was a study that was done comparing uh, similar EMG um, evaluation on the water, on dynamic ERGs and on static ERGs. And what they found were three very different quantities and uh, phases of muscular activation. So in this study, it's important to note that they quantified recovery as well. So where they have presented the stroke cycle here, zero is basically starting at the catch, and then 100 would be at the very end of the recovery. So important to read the method section to understand which they're quantifying when. Uh, but one of the things that they, they highlighted was greater activation generally in the, in the, 
on on water conditions. So not not really important what exactly each of these are, but just getting the general picture that what happens on the erg in a static condition is not necessarily what happens on the water or on a dynamic erg, and that 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 might influence the way that we think about uh, coaching athletes on the erg versus on the water. What the researchers note is that the instability from on water rowing required additional activation of the hip and trunk flexors. So more muscular activation happening in order to maintain stability and balance. They note, especially during the recovery phase, which anybody who's been out on a single skull knows that with the increased instability, extra work has to happen in all of those trunk muscles in order to maintain your position on a very tippy surface, especially compared to rowing on the earth. Uh, when it's a more stable platform and they found that there was not as much activation of stabilizing muscles. So I want to make a quick note that what a lot of our rowing research has conducted on ergs, because it's there, they're very available. It's easy to study athletes on ergs. It's much harder to do it on the water. Um, one of the consistent things that's come up in the research is greater injuries occurring during times of heavier erg use. And the research now is starting to, to move in the direction of thinking that maybe that has something to do with the lack of the stabilizing muscles, that because the erg is such a stable platform, you could basically just shut off. They obviously don't like truly shut off, but the diminished activation of all of those other muscles supporting the spine is part of what leads to that greater injury effect and that rowing on water where there's more uh, distribution of force through muscles rather than through the skeleton or rather than just through the same limited muscles uh, may, may affect the injury outcomes. So even though, even though on water rowing and on land erging look similar mechanically, there's actually very different forces going on um, and, and, di and different movement patterns and different muscular sequencing happening. One idea that often comes up uh, is that core training sort of inherently reduces injury risk, and especially with the low back pain. Uh, there's actually very little evidence that, that general core stability training does reduce low back pain. And I think that part of the reason is a lack of understanding of what the core muscles actually do. Because if we're doing exercise, if we're sinking a bunch of time at exercises like planks and, and sit-ups and other things that train this one very specific type of muscular uh, use and, and strength, but then we don't actually replicate that movement on the water. If that's not a transferable condition, we're developing this really general strength, but we're not developing the specific strength in the movement pattern as we're actually going to use it in the rowing stroke. So I think we've got to find this way to both improve the general strength of muscles, but also to help athletes translate that directly into the movement pattern that they're going to use it on the, on the erg or on the water. So general core stability training of its own, uh, injury research on rowers uh, has, has actually found in some studies that, that those were correlated together. So more core stability training meant more incidences of low back pain. Uh, so certainly in and of itself, it does not reduce low back pain. We need to think a little bit more about that um, and, and what specifically we're doing. So again, the, the strength that we, develop, that, that, that we develop needs to be specific to the stroke motor pattern. Again, big idea is keeping the load on the muscles off of the skeletal structures. So it's great if you get really strong through one way, but can we actually transfer that to the stroke motor pattern? Is that, is that strength transferable? And then I'll note too, that while we are spending this webinar talking about the core, uh, the core does not, does not activate in isolation at all in the rowing stroke and since the rowing stroke is a cycle we can't just take one part out make it super strong uh train the heck out of that and expect it to work back in with the other parts so uh, we'll talk at the end about about strength training for the whole body but i think that that's a limitation in the very typical rowing approach of you know the 20 to 30 minute core circuit if that's not paired with other strength training then just developing the trunk muscles at the midpoint isn't necessarily going to help when we're generating all the force at the foot plate and transferring it all through the handle. So we've got to strengthen everything in that kinetic chain from, from the foot plate through the whole body and then to the handle. So let's talk about actual exercises. Um, 
This is a video that I produced with uh, Blake Gorlay and Joe DeLeo, my co-authors on the Science of Growing publication that Jessica mentioned. Uh, so you'll see them in this video too, just to explain why there's somebody else doing the demonstrations besides me. Uh, what we wanted to present here is our basically core training pathway. So starting from the most basic level, how do we build the general strength, the general stability, progressing it up into the rowing specific strength and fitness. So this is level one core stability training. <clears throat> Here, what we're basically just trying to do is train spinal stability. So especially for new masters coming into the sport, uh, younger rowers who are, are still developing muscular control, it is really important that we develop uh, basic spinal stability. So this is an exercise called the curl up. Uh, there's not a lot of motion here. It's not a crunch. Um, this is, this is my co-author, Joe. He's just getting set up here. Uh, ba basically what we're trying to do is just develop the deep intrinsic core action. So we're trying to, we're not trying to do a whole curl up or a whole sit up that ends up engaging more of the hip flexor muscles, but we're just trying to develop abdominal muscle control. This is the side plank, starting from the most basic version with the knees on the ground. And again, I'm just rolling through these fairly quickly. Happy to take questions either at the end about any specific points uh, or talk about, about any other strength training more broadly. I think some of these will be familiar. Some of them, I hope, will be new. Side bridge going up uh, to the feet is going to make things more difficult. Side plank is one of the ones that I really find especially valuable uh, because we don't ever get into the frontal plane when we're rowing or from the side to side force. So that's a very underdeveloped range of strength for many rowers. Same view, hold on. Okay. And then if we are going to do the front plank, I much prefer to do it as a full tension plank. So it's not hanging out there for uh, 90 seconds, two minutes plus at a time. Uh, but we're really going for full body tension because we're trying to tie in the glutes, the lats, the other areas of the body into the whole body core, core muscle function. Let me just show that one more time. So what Joe's doing here, this is kind of, this is harder to show and easier to just try yourself, but basically in the, in the full tension front plank, what, what you want to do is try to pull your elbows down towards your feet at the same time that you're flexing your lats, flexing your abs, flexing your glutes. Everything's going to be really tight. We'll use this for 15 to 20 second bursts at a time to really just try to develop spinal stability in a, in a full tension environment, uh, not a long-term hanging out on the spine kind of environment. Once we develop the very basic core stability, then we're trying to go, we're trying to introduce more movement. So what I find that many rowers do at that point is they just start loading those core stability exercises for longer and longer. Uh, or in the case of the front plank, you start piling on weight onto your back uh, now in the COVID home training era, you know, finding, finding toddlers to sit on your spine, all sorts of stuff that, uh, if the plank doesn't really transfer over that well to the rowing, then I think we're taking on an unnecessary risk of injury there. Um, so rather than, ra rather than find more load on the spine, uh, I prefer to use the stable spine, but try to get movement at the extremity. So at the feet and the hands. So these are going to be some of the exercises here that we go to for, introducing more movement. <clears throat> now you're going to look at this and say, hey, that's not an abs exercise. And that's correct because the core is about more than just the anterior abdominals. So here in the bird dog, what we're really trying to do is tie in this whole trunk area, trunk and hips, all those muscles attach in the spinal area. So we're trying to work them together to generate spinal stability around moving hands and feet. What we'll often see here with these exercises is a lot of uh, hip tilt or arching or rounding at the lower back. And that's a great opportunity to correct that uh, and, and get rowers developing, again, stable spine, moving hands and feet.
the next exercise here, dead bug variations. These are fairly popular, so maybe more well-known, but again, we're just looking for stable spine and then moving the hands and the feet around the stable spine. Some of these look not that challenging and then give them a try. And I think typically people find that they're more challenging than they expect them to be. Here we're also developing uh, what's called some contralateral strength. So we're getting left, left hand going, right foot going. It could be as much a challenge to coordination for rowers, which is also really productive when we do a repetitive motion sport. I find the plank roll is usually a crowd pleaser because rowers like doing planks. So if they're going to do planks, at least two thirds of them are going to be side planks. So I'll still, I won't, I won't fight the front plank, but we will work in the side plank around that. So the big key on the side plank is that we're developing, I hope my pointer's not going to show up on that. Um, we're developing especially the quadratus lumborum muscle, which is one of those little spinal muscles that really doesn't get much love any other way, and especially not in rowing. Um, a little bit more in the single skull because it's the lateral hip, it's the lateral mover. So in the single skull, that's one of the muscles that's working to, to maintain your stability on the seat. I think that's one of the ones that speculating here, uh, we really see shut off in, in erging where we're just going straight forward and there's not as much need for lateral hip stability. Um, so the side plank, really helpful to develop those general uh, spine muscles. That's easy here, just, just rolling from, again, really stable spine during that transition of rolling from one side to the front plank to the other side. Okay, another variation that I like here is the side plank row. The row portion is not particularly challenging. Oh, let's go back there. Uh, the row portion is not particularly challenging. Uh, we're using a really light band there. But it is challenging to maintain the spinal stability. You can see that Blake's hips and, and lower torso area are working really hard to maintain that stability while there's the extra tension going uh, from the rowing motion. One that's convenient to do too with the uh, cables. Oh, hold on here, the jump slides. Uh, convenient to do too with the with the resistance bands, not requiring a ton of extra equipment. Uh, if you do have some extra equipment, the Swiss ball rollout is another one. You can go both forwards and backwards, as well as some stir the pot motion there with the around motion that Blake's doing. I'm showing just the forwards and backwards version. But the movable surface of the, of the stability ball really adds some additional challenge there in a way that just a standard front plank doesn't. And what we'd be looking for as far as like technical errors is, is sagging at the, at the lower back or uh, compensations elsewhere. So sometimes we'll see like athletes really shifting their hips up and down to generate that movement rather than just keeping again, really stable spine, but moving the extremities around that stable spine. So the nice thing from a, from a master's perspective too, um, as well as from a junior's perspective, really like I think that master's rowers are rowers a lot more than they are master's rowers uh, because we're all fundamentally doing the same stroke motion. The loads are very similar if you're using an erg or if you're on the, if, if you're in a boat, uh, whether you're a master or a junior's rower, the, the, the motions and, and the, and the, that's okay. Am I unmuted now? Okay. Um, so I, I train rowers very similarly with specific individual differences. For the most part, they're all doing similar exercises. We'll take individual stuff into account. Um, 
but but as far as as far as practice being significantly different for masters rowers i think that everybody's rowers firsts and the first and then there's small variations around that for their their specific type or um competitive level Okay, so here's here's Blake demonstrating how we can actually get this moving into the rowing specific territory of stable spine, but mobile hips and mobile extremities. That's the real key that makes rowing different from other sports is that the spine is stable, but the hip goes through a ton of range of motion. So just watch this just with an eye on the hip joint here and notice from the position of layback how much motion there is all the way up to the catch. And yet the spine stays in a very similar position. So we want, we want spinal stability around mobile hips. Now just th think about where the hips are relative to where the spine is. Those are quite close together. It'd be very common for those to work similarly. But in rowing, again, we have, we have a large hip range of motion, but we want very little spinal motion. And that was one of the things that the research noted in that, in that, uh, ERG EMG study that was done on Canadian national team female rowers and they noted that the rowers were all very skilled at maintaining uh, a rigid spinal position and then moving around that and in other rowing research they've seen that there's a lot more spinal flexion and spinal extension any spinal motion is basically wasted effort because force from the foot plate is going into spinal motion rather than being transferred through that area as a rigid lever to, to have the force acted on from the handle. So what we're trying to do is get force to go as effectively from the foot plate to the handle as possible. If there's a lot of movement at the individual joints in between there that doesn't produce boat motion, that's, that's wasted effort. So here Blake's using these. These are basically just PVC pipes to drive into the ground. So here we're getting like the, the lat connection in there too. And it, it, th I found this to be a much more effective way uh, to teach athletes to engage at the different positions of the rowing stroke. Um, I'll sometimes see coaches hold the handle. They'll stand on the other side of the fan and reach over to hold the handle against the athlete's force. And that's going to get a front end only because the coach can't be there for the back end of the stroke. Uh, but also it's only going to activate the posterior trunk side. That's not getting any of the feel that the athlete's going to have of the torso being a braking mechanism uh, during the body swing and into the recovery. So with these, with these PVC pipes here, Blake's going to be working hard to push those into the ground, really feel that torso connection, uh, and, and dial in the, the release position where we want the spine to be at the release. So if you, if you have some PVC pipes, you might need like a tennis ball or, or rubber stopper or something on the bottom of them. And then you basically got this set up too. And then the core exercise that I like the most for rowers is the rock back. So we could do this on a bench. We could do it on a stability ball. I'll show it a couple different ways. Uh, you can try this yourself if you've got a chair that doesn't have a back on it or something you could sit on. Um, I'll often start this just at this point, which is the isometric version. We'll get athletes just to rock back to their layback position and then just hold that. Really important while we're doing this that, that we have good contact from the feet. So we want heels pushing into the ground. I find that a lot of times people will sit back in this back position. They're like, oh, it's not that hard. And then I'll say, yeah, but okay, push the heels down now. And then it gets really hard. And what the heels are doing, what pushing the heels down does is it engages the posterior chain. So the, the glutes mostly there, which then takes the hip flexors out of it because we can't have maximal posterior and maximal anterior tension at the same time. So pushing the heels down, engages the posterior, minimizes the anterior, takes the hip flexors less in the motion, and really puts the emphasis on the abdominals. I find that a lot of rowers struggle with this, especially if they really struggle with feet out rowing, because they've learned to cheat by using the hip flexors rather than using the abdominal muscles. So this is a great exercise, both for teaching the the correct um, movement that we want athletes to be doing. Just rocking between the 11 o'clock position and the one o'clock position without excessive layback. And then training this, this hip motion of getting the body forward, not from the shoulders or from the spine, but just from the hips, as well as training good heel contact. And then we're getting the, the muscular activation coming along for the ride. So here, here we're training both the movement and also the muscles involved. 
Uh, same thing here. We're really looking for the error of like the athlete slumping out. So if they're slumping, just basically consider this the release of the stroke. If you if they're doing something that you don't want them doing at the release, don't let them do it in this exercise either. So here we've added the stability ball. Uh, this is just an unstable surface, so it introduces some extra challenge. I'm also going hands forward instead of hands above. It makes it a little bit easier to start. We'd want to progress athletes basically from, from the isometric position, so from the bench where they're just sitting there holding that position, to the rock back on the bench in that stable environment, uh, and then to the stability ball with the hands forward, and then to the stability ball with the hands behind the head. And what I've found is that when rowers can do this with good heel pressure and good spinal stability and uh, good range of motions so where they're going from the 11 o'clock layback position to the 1 o'clock body over position, if they can do three to four sets of, of about 30 seconds doing that, the core strength is, is rarely going to be your problem in rowing. So at that point, when an athlete can do that, that's where I start to say, okay, we're going to get more benefit from pushing your strength in other exercises than we are continuing to hammer away at the core. So th th three to four sets of 30 to 60 seconds of, of rock backs would be, it would be a great range for many rowers to be in. Because what we're getting here is both the strength and the motor pattern. And then once we're ticking up into the 45 second range, they were really getting great endurance out of that too but we're not doing it through just holding planks or doing a bunch of crunches or doing stuff that then puts a lot of load on the spine. So um, again, that would be a master specific note, except that I think it's also really important for junior rowers. Um, and then for college rowers too, we're going to be doing a high workload is that we're minimizing spinal stress. I, I don't want the core training to hurt the athlete. I want the core training to be better for the athlete. So I'm always thinking when we're doing core training, how does this tie in with the rowing motion? How is this strengthening the muscles? And is this sparing load on the spine? And then I just wanted to note too that part, part of this is the everything else. So the core training is just one part. Um, this is my exercise index that I have available on my YouTube channel um, for all these different exercises. So all of these contribute to boat motion in some way. The pushing exercises would be the least of those, although I think it's still very important to train those uh, to maintain muscle balance while we'll do while we're doing a heavy repetitive motion sport that develops only a certain side but from this point over this is all contributing to boat motion so it's really important that we don't just spend all of our time in core training but we also work to develop the other muscles and the and the other movements as well and then just how this fits in with the whole program uh I start every program with a full body warm up. It's about 10 minutes of various low load movements. I do like to include the full tension plank there as I find that to be a really nice way to get the, the trunk muscles going and again, to tie them in with the uh, other muscles of the, of the hips and of the upper body. Uh, then we'll move into our main work exercises. These tend to be overhead presses, squats and, and deadlift variations. Uh, that's where the bulk of our, of our strength and power work happens. So that we're really looking for increasing general force potential of the athlete. Uh, and then we move into three to four different assistance work exercises where we're going to do higher, higher volume work, more muscle focused here. We'll really get into like the muscle balance stuff. So that's where we do our horizontal pressing. Um, we do want to build row and pull down. So, uh, working on lat strength there and back strength. Um, I really like single leg squats uh, as well as full range of motion, hip, hip lifts. So, or hip hinge lifts. Um, so band, band pull throughs or glute ham raises where we're working the hip hinge through the full range of motion instead of just the partial range of motion that we're always getting in rowing. Then we come back to specific exercises for the shoulders, uh, glutes or hip muscles generally and the core muscles. So um, there we basically use like our small sort of isolation exercises and that's where I get core training into. Uh, I don't do the 30 minute core circuit uh, because again, I think it's just overkill for, for most athletes that most athletes can be better off with maybe 10 minutes tops of core training per session um, in proportion to everything else. So if you could do 30 minutes of core training, great. What else are you doing? Are you doing strength training for your lower body, for your upper body, uh, for your horizontal pressing, for other muscles that are neglected by the rowing stroke? 
If not, then I think that your time would be better spent doing slightly less core training, uh, doing more general strength training. So, uh, and then from the core training too, the, we, we, we had some interesting back and forth while we were writing that science of growing article of, is it a progression or is it a categorization system? I don't have real firm benchmarks as far as like when an athlete moves from level one spinal stability to level two, uh, spine stability with movement at the hands and the feet to level three stable, stable spine with the mobile hips and the mobile extremities. Uh, what I'm mostly looking for there is like movement competency. So are they, are they maintaining a stable spine through all those different movements rather than like a specific uh, load parameters? Um, I, th I think it's really useful to use that seated rock back exercise with relatively new athletes because then they can learn in a land stable environment what that back end of the stroke is supposed to feel like as they go from uh, through, through the body swing and then to reversing over to the body over. Um, so I've, I've used that, that, that exercise with rowers of all levels, um, to, to teach those skills as much as to develop the strength in those muscles. So that's basically the big, the big picture of program design. Uh, that's where you can find more from me. I am happy to take questions now. Um, most, uh, I'll be able to give the best answers for sort of general program level questions. Uh, it, it gets hard when it's like into people's really specific uh, injury situations. For one thing, I'm a strength coach, not a physical therapist. So I can't really talk about injuries except in the general prevention strategies. Um, and then everybody has individual situations, especially now with, with equipment and all that stuff. So if, if your questions are more big picture, more general, um, happy to answer those. And then you're welcome to email me with any of your more specific stuff. And I'm happy to write back that way. So we have a few questions here. Should I go ahead and um, read off what great. we've got so yeah. far? Okay. Yeah, sounds so, great. Let's see. Um, you mentioned not wanting to simu simulate rowing erging with weights. What are your thoughts on the last 500 machine? Uh, that's like the seated, seated contraption, right? This is the other problem is that everybody has different words for all these different things. This is from um, James, James, James Long. Do you, you want to unmute James and clarify? Yeah, it's, it's a seated row machine that um, we don't have one, but we've thought about it. It, um, it, simulates the full rowing stroke but you can add plates to it um, so it's an erg that's weighted and then it actually lowers the weights for you so you're not taking the load on the way back down you're only doing work during the rowing stroke itself sure um my concern there is that athletes already get a lot of load through the rowing stroke motor pattern so um especially athletes now with the ubiquity of the static erg training it in a year round environment, static ergs are higher force than, than on water rowing or than dynamic ergs. Um, and athletes spend a lot of time on static ergs and adding more load to that through the same motor pattern. I've, I've not found uh, a, a beneficial way to do that while still keep, keeping in mind, like the injury risk considerations of, of overload and overuse. So um, I, I, I would always rather train an athlete in a, in a full body environment, um, outside the rowing stroke pattern, they're doing enough kind of transfer work on the ergs already. And then, and then keeping in mind too, that erging is different than, than on water rowing. So I think we're going like multiple layers of different, but we're still calling it like a simulation, but it's really not a simulation. So I don't know if that, if that answer makes sense, but, um, Basically, it, it, it doesn't really simulate rowing, but what it does do is add overuse to the muscles that are already taxed from rowing and erging training. Cool. That's not a criticism of that machine. That, that's the same for, you know, high rep, high rep jumpies, high rep bench pulls, um, all that stuff that like sort of simulates rowing, but just it, it doesn't really in terms of rowing. So sounds, sounds good. So the next question is from KZ. Would you do these daily or as part of more intensive strength training sessions? This, this was about halfway through. So I'm not, KZ, if you want to unmute yourself and clarify what you're referring to there. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for this great conversation. I guess my question is, would you recommend in addition to obviously doing them as part of your program design or strength 
program, would you suggest some of these core exercises as, as more of a daily habit as well? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think if it, if it helps you, yes. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't prescribe daily strength training of, of really anything for, for athletes though. The, the vast majority of my strength training with rowers is two to three times a week, tend to be full body sessions. Um, again, fo focusing on, on maximizing force potential with some of our squat and deadlift variations, developing muscles, developing different movements with our assistance work, and then developing core muscles and the other muscles neglected by the rowing stroke. I think we've got to remember that there's recovery time involved with any strength training and that athletes are already getting trunk work from all the rowing training they're doing. So adding yet more core work onto that, if athletes aren't sufficiently recovering from it, can then just add up to load load on the spine overuse on those on those same muscles again keeping in mind that like we're also getting that in via rowing so i think that comes back to the idea that like core stability training on its own does not does not protect against injury um i think i think a lot of folks sort of do it like more more out of the habit or out of like the the kind of bo bo boogeyman idea rather than because they're actually getting strength training uh effect from from the exercises so I, I think there's i think there's great value to movement um daily movement for sure but but as far as daily strength training i'm not sure if we're considering that we also need to be recovering from the training thanks very much nice okay so there's a few more um do you recommend stacking feet on top of each other in the plank in the side plank or having feet split this is from abigail um i like the feet split like like joe demonstrated in in that video um, I think that we can get to a better hip position that way rather than stacking the feet on top of each other, but try it yourself. See, see which way you're more comfortable. Cool. And this is from uh, Mike Wagner. If you are doing core strength exercises and erging a piece in the same workout, which do you recommend doing first? Mike, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, strength training, uh, after, after rowing in that context, um, basically I wouldn't want the fatigue from the core training to then influence your spinal position when you're working. So if we go, if we go and fatigue your, especially anterior torso muscles through a strength training exercise, and then we say, okay, now, now hop on the ergs. Mm -hmm. What's likely to happen is the, is we'll see technical errors on the erg that we might not have seen otherwise, because we've gone and fatigued a, a crucial part of that movement. Mm -hmm. What, why I'm worried about that is it, if we're doing pieces, the repetitive loading in a bad movement position on the erg is gonna is gonna add up more much more than it is the other way around. If you're doing a few sets of strength training uh, after after the erging, so um, in in general, I prefer splitting up the sessions, especially for core training. Though, if you've got to do it in one session, then do that after the erging. Cool. And then somebody's uh, Dan Haig is actually asking about the training program that you you helped develop with me. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about that and and um, you know your individual consultations as a resource for people and 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 how all that works. Yeah. Um, so the training program that that Je Jessica and I worked together on uh, was through the U.S. Rowing Masters Camp this summer. They did a virtual Masters Camp that I think was three weeks of. Mm -hmm. uh, erging or rowing programming from Marlene Royal, uh, webinars from, from various different guests, uh, and then I provided a strength training program as part of that. Um, I do offer month-to-month -month coaching. Um, it is very similar to what's in my book, though. So I think so, yeah. so, some people think that like I'm holding out, you know, that there's some secret sauce that I don't give away in the book, but that I that I use with training folks. It's really is really very similar. So uh, referring to that last slide there of the program design, that's my general template that I operate from. It's going to be individually different for the athlete based on their goals, desires, equipment. Um, training background. So what what Jessica and I also did was then take the program talked to get on the same page as far as equipment uh and and her training background um, and then and then customize the program for that so um if you if you would like to learn how to program for yourself that's what i tried to to, to, to write the book to to do um if you if you want more help i do offer online month-to-month -month coaching as well as uh just one one-off consultations basically answer detailed training questions 
And then um, I think this is the last question here. Um, how do you uh, how do you recommend peri periodizing strength training? So and that and that is yeah, yeah that that, that is um, I've I've got a bunch of articles on my website as far as like the the overall breakdown, um, including one that's just around masters athletes specifically, since that schedule gets a little bit different. Um, and uh, I, I also have a lot more detail in my book about that. But in general, what I like is a is an off-season phase for any athlete, even if you specialize in rowing, I'm going to have at least a 10-week phase where we're deprioritizing rowing and erging. Maybe we still do some, but it's definitely on the back burner uh, because I think it's really hard to gain uh, appreciable strength and muscle mass or change your body composition, reducing body fat while also chasing performance goals uh, mm -hmm. and, and the kinds of training volumes that, that rowers do. So I will always have that off season phase um, where we're, we're working to develop general physical skills, not so much on rowing and erging, doing aerobic cross training and stuff instead mm -hmm. that then turns into more of a preseason phase um, as the athlete works to develop specific strength, uh, power, and, and working around a more intense rowing training load, uh, and then into a competitive phase where the athlete focuses on, um, tr on, on racing and performance. So there we basically move strength training to the back burner so that the athlete can fully focus on the rowing training um, and, and displaying the results of their training. Because if, if we've done a bunch of squat workout that, that week and then we say, okay, you know, ha have a nice time at the championships, uh, that, that wouldn't be putting the athlete in, in a great position. So I think it's really important that we do have those three different phases though. Um, I hear from a lot of rowers who, who really skip out on the off season phase and they try to go basically just the preseason. They'll do like for the ju junior schedule to be like a winter preseason and then straight into the spring competitive season with diminished training because the rowing workload is so high and there's more specific performance goals and there's just not enough momentum to really maintain what you built in the preseason through that competitive season. So I think that the, the off season really exists to, to build momentum, make progress, and then you've really got something worth maintaining when you actually get into your competitive spring season. So mm -hmm. I think having some component of each of those is really necessary part of the overall, of, of the overall training process, whether you're masters, junior, collegiate, whatever. Nice. Okay. Any 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 other last uh, questions for Will while we have him here? I have one question, Jessica, and thank you for doing this, Will, and Jessica for arranging it. Um, I'm just curious if you're in the book, if you talk about um, body position for the different exercises, because a lot of them seem similar to yoga to me. Um, and I know it's critical that you have the, you know, to get the, the proper uh, extra or, uh, results that you want to have good body position. Yeah, I, I, I focus the book on the on the programming side of things uh, because I think it's really difficult to explain body position in <laughs> in a written text. Um, but then that's what I uh, built my YouTube channel for was basically so that I could provide dem demonstrations of all these different exercises as well as the coaching cues that I use. And that's not as good as in person coaching, of course. So I think the best case scenario is that you have a personal trainer or a strength coach or someone who can teach you the movements. Those people don't always know rowing though. So as far as like what, what makes rowers successful, how do we manage all the different stressors that rowers are exposed to? Uh, that's what I produced my book for. So that ideally we could put those two worlds together from here. Here's what, here's what general personal trainers and strength coaches know mm -hmm. about physical movement and strengthening. Here's what rowing, rowing coaches know and rowers know about what we need in order to move boats. Uh, now let's put those two together in a, in a, in a training environment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. And, and Will, here's another one from James um, Longlerno. Um, what are your thoughts on the different shoes, foot stretcher systems out there? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's a great question for a strength coach. Um, I think that the more that we can customize the boat, great, as long as we're really aware that there's the equal opposite reaction for every rigging change that we do. Um, so I, I would always defer that to, to the rowing coach. Um, and, and especially if we have a physical therapist too, to work with like physically putting the athletes in, in the best positions. Um, I've seen that be really successful from rowing coach with physical therapists, whether that's orthotics inserts, 
uh, or, or, or changing foot position, seat pads, all that stuff. Like there's, there's a lot of ways that we can customize the rowing environment, but I think they've got to be done really carefully. Um, so that we're not making a physical change at the, ex like for performance at the expense of health or at the expense of, uh, a, a technical factor. Mm -hmm. so. And there's a follow-up to that. What about the impact of feet, heels, height in the boat? I mean, uh, yeah, again, re really depends on like how you're built, how you're trying to row. Cause if we, if we raise your feet and they actually, they did this in one research study, raised the feet, but they didn't change the seat pad height or the, mm -hmm. the, the seat height. So theoretically the athlete would produce more horizontal force, mm -hmm. which would be good. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately what they found is that the athletes had to row really short because they couldn't get their shoulders over their hips mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the shorter rowing resulted in worse power outputs. Mm -hmm. even though horizontal force was maximized. So we increased horizontal force, but we decreased stroke length by making that change. So that's a perfect example of like, mm -hmm. theoretically, physically, this would put the athlete in a better environment, but mm -hmm. rowing technically is, is its own beast. And, and you, you changed things too much there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, just lastly, before we forget, um, would you like to share a little bit about the projects that you have coming up? I oh, yeah. Yeah, so thanks. Um, for, for anybody interested in either my book or um, in the Science of Rowing publication, it's a monthly publication that I produced with two other rowing strength coaches, Blake and Joe, from that video. Uh, and we are donating 100% of our new membership profits for next month to the A Most Beautiful Thing Inclusion Fund, uh, which works to support um, more rowing opportunities for young people, especially young people from diverse uh, backgrounds and under-resourced communities. So the a Most Beautiful Thing fund, fund works with the George Pocock uh, Foundations. They support ERGED, uh, they support coach education um, and, and getting more opportunities for more rowers to get on the water. So if you check us out in the next month, um, your membership will go towards that. If you wanna stick around after, great, we'd love to have you. Um, also members get access to all the back issues. So if you join us next month, your membership goes to, to the a most beautiful thing fund. Uh, and also you get three issues for the price of one. So that's, that's, the, that's the news there. Cool. Cool. Nice. Well, anything else you'd like to share? Cool. Uh, thanks okay. again for having me. Thanks everybody for being here. Go, go enjoy the bottom of the third inning or, or whatever <laughs> we're into in the game right now. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks again, Will. Appreciate it. Okay.